the movie that really really rocked my world. That was The Exorcist. I saw it in its initial release back in 74. And I was 15, I think. And like I said, my mom was great. She would take me to see these things. And there was never, I'd never seen anything like that in terms of the effect it had on an audience. And it's it's hard for people now who weren't there to understand that this was a movie that freaked people the F out. I mean, people ran out of those theaters screaming and fainting and vomiting and just, and then they would, they would be disturbed for days. I remember going to a restaurant at the time and having a waitress who spilled our coffee all over us and was shaking and we asked her if she was okay. And she, she said she had seen The Exorcist two weeks ago. So, I mean, it was a movie that really shook people up. And when I saw that a movie could do that to people, that was kind of when I said, this is what I want to do for a living. It's good to see you. Where are you today? I am in my home office in uh, my house in L.A. Oh, in L.A.? Okay. Where yeah, are she's a Hollywood girl. Oh, well, okay. Right. <laughs> You know, you don't think of of horror, you know, so much in in California because we're such a young place. Oh, I think you think of it as horror. Hollywood is horror. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I used to be a screenwriter. Yeah. Oh, did you really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. she's um, done many things. Many things. Yeah. So, because you've edited a lot of short stories on horror, what what are the what makes something really? scary and what what are the elements that you have to have to make something that's really filled with horror and dread well i i think there are a couple of things that make horror work one of the things that i think horror is more dependent on than other genres is setting the mm -hmm. setting is really really important in horror because it contributes so much to the mood of the piece and setting plays such a part i think in our subconscious in terms of old decayed buildings are just naturally very disturbing to us and then of course intent is a big part of it too and this is how i always define horror if your intent is first and foremost to scare or disturb people, then it's a horror piece. And I mean, I always laugh when I hear the people who made the, the movie of Silence of the Lambs try to say, oh, no, 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 it's not a horror film. Yes, it really is, because your intent was not to mystify people. It was to scare them and horrify them. And you did a brilliant job and it's a horror movie. So do you think that was Thomas Harris's intention with writing the book? Or do you think that's why we like serial killers and all that kind of stuff? Well, you speak for yeah, yourself. Yeah. You speak for yourself. You like serial killers. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't uh, like serial killers, but I'm I mean, fascinated by the genre. Well, I think it's the why are we? I mean, I've so we have so many questions, but like, why are we fascinated with something that freaks us out? Is it the adrenaline? Run? Like, what what is our relationship to horror? And yeah, we, yeah, let's start I there. I get asked this all the time as a Halloween expert, because, of course, people are like, why do we have to have a holiday that celebrates fear and horror and that kind of thing? And and I think it's because we need to test our limits every once in a while. It helps us sort of figure out how to deal with real life horrors, which is why, I mean, I don't like real life horror things. Um, I, I will Wait, watch what, what's real life horror? I mean, like, for example... I would n not really want to read a book about the terrible atrocities being committed in the Ukraine right now. That would be too much for me. Or what about um, Roe v. Wade being overturned? Yeah, right. Like, exactly. <laughs> but, but when you read Ambrose Pierce, because some of those stories take place on Civil War battlefields, is it distant enough for you that, that you can appreciate it? or? Yeah, it gives it that one remove thing, one step removed from your reality where you can enter it and know that you are still safe, but you get to test your fears. That's one of the reasons people love haunted attractions at Halloween. You you are going into an immersive environment, but you know you're safe. Nobody's really a monster there. Nobody's really going to hurt you. And so that's where the element of fun comes in with those. Now, Halloween. So do you think of things like Dracula, these mythological sort of archetypes, you know, like do they stem from something real or do we just want to be scared? You know, like uh, what do we what do we think of vampires and demons and all that? 
you know. Uh, in terms of the actual like supernatural vampire, I mean, obviously we all I think know those don't really exist, but the idea of a creature that is immortal and is eternally youthful, but has made this terrible trade off about having to suck human blood to remain that way is such an enduring myth and is found in, in many cultures in some form or other. And it's interesting to me that over the last century, we have watched the vampire in Western culture become increasingly eroticized. And it just seems to speak to something that Westerners in particular particular find appealing i'm not sure what what the real heart of that is but there's one bigger question there because you you know thinking of women and women in horror and women that are sexualized or you know all of the think what do you think that is and who's perpetuating that vision are women doing that or where's that coming from because i know this is kind of an area that you're interested in yeah, I, it, I mean, it was interesting that it seems to have gotten a big revitalization with the Twilight books. And I mean, I know people in my writers of my genre love to dismiss those books. But the fact is, they were a huge cultural bombshell. They were gigantic with young people and especially with young women readers. And I think they speak to the idea that you are so special that this eternally beautiful creature finds you alluring. And so I think they kind of fulfill an ego need in a, in a lot of young girls who may not be secure with themselves yet and can enter this world and can imagine that they are Bella in this world. Yeah. You know, did you, um, so where did it start for you? Were you always, a, were you a science fiction fan? Were you a horror fan? Like, how did you come to this? I always love both. Actually, I, I was I often describe myself as that weird little girl who wanted to be a monster, not a princess at Halloween. <laughs> I had very indulgent parents, thank goodness, who thought this stuff was great. I mean, my mom and I would stay up late at night watching whatever horror movie came on and my dad and I would make little monster toys and things like that. Although I kind of grew up reading mainly science fiction, but I really loved the horror movies that would come on the universal classics. Um, I really, really loved those and still do. And I grew up kind of reading H.G. Wells and, and Jules Verne and then discovered a little later on some of the wonderful authors like Harlan Ellison and Philip K. Dick. And I didn't really get into horror until I was in my teens. And then I had a cousin who sent me a box set of H.P. Lovecraft and that kind of <laughs> yeah. got, got the horror thing into high gear. Well, yeah, H.P. Lovecraft goes back a long ways with a lot of people, huh? Yeah. As somebody who has an aversion to horror, I can't watch it. I don't think I've ever seen a horror movie. I mean, I, I go like this, or I have, you know, which says a lot about me. I'm obviously very insecure, but you can watch it and you don't feel like freaked out or do you like, I just want to know how you have the tolerance for it or can you so disassociate and say it's not really happening. I, I'm just curious how people can, can watch these things. Um. Uh, is some of them have disturbed me a lot. The one that really got to me, I saw it when I was still a teenager, was Dawn of the Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead. I mean, I didn't sleep for like two nights after seeing that movie. And now I look at it and I think it's one of the greatest horror movies ever made, especially since it had that impact on me. But yes, most things, I, I think I have acquired a pretty thick skin <laughs> by now. So there are not a lot of fictional things that still reach me on that kind of level. So you, did you watch a lot of movies growing up too? Yeah, yeah. And and so where did it go from there? Because you talked about science fiction and horror. Were they both, were, were you a Star Trek fan? Were you a... Yeah, I was, as a kid, I was probably a bit of a Trek sure. The movie that really really rocked my world. That was The Exorcist. I saw it in its initial release back in 74. And I was 15, I think. And like I said, my mom was great. She would take me to see these things. And there was never, I'd never seen anything like that in terms of the effect it had on an audience. And it's it's hard for people now who weren't there to understand that this was a movie that freaked people the F out. I mean, people ran out of those theaters screaming and fainting and vomiting and just, and then they would, they would be disturbed for days. I remember going to a restaurant at the time and having a waitress who spilled our coffee all over us and was shaking. And we asked her if she was okay. And she 
She said she had seen The Exorcist two weeks ago. So, I mean, it was a movie that really shook people up. And when I saw that a movie could do that to people, that was kind of when I said, this is what I want to do for a living. And so I went to college and actually majored in screenwriting in particular, rather than just writing in general. And so did you come to Hollywood and write in Hollywood? And, and, and then what made you get out of that? I did. And ironically, it wasn't until I had my tiny modicum of success as a screenwriter that I realized this is not for me. I made a few of those really god awful movies that like show up on the sci fi channel at four in the morning and, and they're an embarrassment. And, but there's my name plastered all over them as the writer. And it would could be lucrative, certainly, but it was not satisfying to me. And that was when I kind of started to think maybe I really need to be looking into prose. And so in the early 90s was when I finally kind of veered away from film and much more into uh, short stories and, and novels. And yes, and I found out that that was where I actually got way more pride and satisfaction. Now, when you're beginning to do that, do you go back to other writers and look at the way they're doing it? Do you do you do you have to struggle with the form initially? You know, do you go to Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote poetry and wrote stories and say, well, what's the components of this and how do I rebuild them? I was always a voracious reader, so I, I already had all of that in my like writer's tool chest. <laughs> By the time I got into thinking seriously about writing short fiction, I was in my 30s. So I kind of had my own education under my belt at that point about how to do short stories. And then because I was here in LA and because I had my minor movie credits such as they were, I actually was around some incredible people who did write and published short horror fiction. And there was one guy who I still think is possibly the greatest horror writer of all time named Dennis Edgison, who was a local LA writer. And I was very fortunate to get to know him and he kind of mentored me along the way. And so when you've got somebody like that, who's kind of helping you out, it, it certainly gives you a little bit of a leg up on both writing these things and selling them. Now, how do you put together an anthology? Because you have to have a lot more you know, a wider thing of what you, it's almost like what you leave in is the rare part of all the things you discard on the side. So how do you start to pull together an anthology? Uh, yeah, I've done anthologies now. There are different kinds of anthologies, just as there are everything else. There are the anthologies that are all modern stories that have never been published before. And with those, you'll be reading probably from a slush pile of submissions. You may work through thousands of those. And then I've done anthologies like this one, which is Weird Women 2 that came out last year. And this right. is an anthology of all classic reprint stories, mainly from the 19th century. So when you're putting one of these together, you still are reading hundreds of stories and and there are the ones that just hit you and that you cannot wait to share with the world and those are the ones that you end up saying this has to go in the book and with this book I had a co-editor who is a longtime dear friend named Les Klinger whose breadth of knowledge is astonishing and so it makes it a particular pleasure to work with somebody like that we, no. we go back and forth and he'll say, I love this one. And I'll say, oh, yes. And I love this one. And so they're really fun to put together working with him. M. Anastasius. Yes. So how do you find that story? People haven't talked about that story in a long time. How do you find that? That is my gem from our book that's coming out in August, Haunted Tales, includes a story called M. Anastasius by a writer named Diana Moolock. Most people have never heard of either the writer or this story. I found this story by digging through correspondence of Charles Dickens, um, because people may not know that not only did Charles Dickens write what may be the greatest ghost story of all time, A Christmas Carol, but he was also a major editor in the mid 19th century. And every year he put out these Christmas issues of the magazines that he was editing that were packed with ghost stories, because that was still the tradition at the time told ghost stories on Christmas Eve. And so he filled his Christmas issues with ghost stories. And he had like a little stable of writers that he would buy from regularly. And in 1855, I think it is, he 
I found in his correspondence a letter he wrote to someone. And he said in this letter, I have just read the, the best ghost story ever written. And of course, I'm like, oh, what is this? I got to read this. And so I tracked it down through his notes. I found the story and I ended up almost agreeing with him. The story is amazing. It feels timeless to me. It's about a woman who has grown up with a very controlling guardian. And when the guardian dies, the control doesn't stop. And it's the kind of toxic masculinity thing that I think a lot of 21st century women will go, oh, my God, this is 150 years old, this story. So, yeah, that was very exciting to find that. I think one of the things we were hearing about you is that a lot of these stories were actually written, the ghost stories were written by women. Is that true? And talk about that. And were the ghost stories or the short story format, a way to kind of really talk about what is really going on, right? About it, cult, what was happening to them. Just talk a little bit more, because I don't think anybody, I don't think Jesse knows that much about that. Maybe you do, Jesse. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I've done two volumes of this weird women now. These are stories, like I said, mainly from the 19th century, all by women writers. People may not know that many of the best horror and ghost stories of the last 150 years were by women. They tend to think of people like M.R. James or Edgar Allan Poe or H.P. Lovecraft or Algernon Blackwood. They don't know that there were even more women, I think, writing these stories uh, from about 1850 on. And one of the reasons that we may not know that a lot of these incredible stories are out there is that these women wrote in a variety of genres. They didn't just write the one kind of story. And they tended to be very socially active in things like the suffragette movement, the labor movements that were big in the 19th century. These women were very politically aware, and that is indeed reflected in some of these stories. Um, a number of the stories are set in a large wealthy household and the lead character is not the madam or the wife of the household. It's a domestic who's working for them, who sees things through the eyes of a poor person coming into this fabulously wealthy old family. And these stories are still chilling and relevant, I think, most of the time. One of the things that we did in these books was annotate them because they certainly do include obsolete phrases or mentions to places that modern readers might not know. So as we go through the stories, we put in the little footnotes so modern readers will understand, oh, that's what that means. And I think it just helps people appreciate these stories that much more. Helen Duncan. You know, what were your thoughts on Helen Duncan? <laughs> I love Helen Duggan. She's actually one of my favorite interesting people. For people who don't know, she was a medium in the middle of the 20th century. She was at the heart of one of the most famous trials of the middle 20th century as a fraudulent medium. And she was tried under the 1735 Witchcraft Act in Great Britain, which of course is insane. And her trial was so gigantic and so popular that she was getting headlines over the war effort at the time. This is 1944. Britain's at war. And it angered at Winston Churchill. He actually wrote some note to his ministers saying, what's this all about? What's this witchcraft trial? And Helen Duncan was an interesting person who had been a medium for like 30 years prior to the trial. She had been investigated by famous investigators like Harry Price, who worked with the Society for Psychical Research. Now, he certainly pronounced her a fraud, and she most likely was but she was also obviously very gifted at theatrical presentation. Even skeptics would go to her seances and come out and say, well, I don't believe any of it, but I sure had fun. Mm -hmm. But at her trial, her defense attorneys wanted the judge to allow her to bring out her spirit guide, who was a really gruff figure called Walter, who would insult her in the midst of his channeled messages and so forth. And uh, the judge refused to allow that, which was interesting. And so instead, her defense attorneys brought forth dozens and dozens of witnesses who all said that she had done such wonderful things for them, that she had given them such great comfort and such great great solace and they believed everything that she said and so it was a really interesting trial she was found guilty and she was actually sentenced to the maximum sentence at the time which was six months in prison and she did her six months and she got out and she actually was arrested about seven years later again for fraudulent mediumship but she's a very interesting person to me I one of the things about her seance is, is that she supposedly produced ectoplasm, which was this 
sort of filmy white matter that was supposed to be like the makeup of the spirits and so forth. And it was really cheesecloth that she apparently would swallow before the seance and could regurgitate at will. And I always say that to me, being able to regurgitate at will is at least as amazing as being able to talk to spirits. So I agree. (laughs) Is it still against the law? Is this, or when was that law revoked? That law was revoked not long after her trial. Thank goodness they actually did away with that ridiculous 1735 act. They did replace it with a very specific fraudulent medium law. And as far as I know, that law is still active in Great Britain. You know, it'd be like um, basing the dismantling of Roe versus Wade on a thing from the 16th century. You know what I mean? Go figure. (laughs) (laughs) Now, were the Fox sisters the beginning of all of that, of seances? Yeah, you know your stuff, Jesse. They were indeed. They are the ones who invented both spiritualism and the form of the seance, because prior to that, they they come along in 1848. And before that, contacting the dead was a very different thing. It was usually something that was done solo. You were either a magician who would go through these insane rituals, or you were a seeker of knowledge who might be instructed by an oracle to go sit on a graveyard tombstone at night and you would fall asleep and dream about the ghost or whatever. With the Fox sisters, we get this whole new idea that suddenly it's a gathering of people. And the the reason for that was that the Fox sisters were two teenage girls. It starts in 1848 in this farmhouse near Rochester, New York. They are hearing these strange noises coming from all over this big house they're in. And in the house are the two girls and their parents. There are three other children in the family who are now adults and have already moved out of the house. So Kate and Maggie are the two teenage girls. They are hearing these strange knocking sounds coming from all over this house. And they start to figure out a way to communicate with these knocking sounds. They figure out they can ask questions and say, hey, knock once for yes or twice for no or whatever. And word of this gets out. And within weeks, hundreds of people are showing up at this farmhouse asking to witness this miracle. And then their older sister, Leah, who lives in Rochester, is the one who says, you know, there's maybe some money to be made here. And she brings Kate and Maggie to live with her in Rochester. And she starts bringing people in to see their seances. She's charging now. And she sits them down at her big dining room table where there's enough room for everyone to sit comfortably. She puts Kate and Maggie at one end. They start doing the thing, going into the trance state or whatever, calling on the spirits. The knocking start happening, and that's how the seance is born. And that goes on for a long time. It's not really prevalent now, but, but you know, when does it die out, and why do you think it, I mean, is the rise of radio and television and, and movies and things, is that a contributor to it disappearing in some form? It died out before that. It was very, very popular. We're talking spiritualism now, which was the religion that came out of this. And spiritualism was huge for about 30 years. And it was big in both Great Britain and in America. There were thousands of mediums. It was thought that essentially anyone could act as a medium, although obviously some were more gifted than others. It starts to die out because one of the original tenets of spiritualism was that the people who were interested in it actually believed it was the only religion that could be proven scientifically. Now, the fact that it was continually disproven (laughs) scientifically didn't bother them initially, but it reached the point where every single medium was so continually debunked that it was starting to fail by about the 1870s. And then in 1888, Kate and Maggie come out and say the whole thing was fraud. We made everything up. The rapping noises come from us being able to crack our toe knuckles in a particular <laughs> way. And that kind of put a stake in the heart of spiritualism for about the next 30 years until World War I comes along. And then World War I is such a gigantic, tragic event. So many people are losing their loved ones in this war. They just don't know what's happened to them. And it kind of gives a boost again to both mediums and the use of things like the Ouija board comes in as a result of World War I. And then it just kind of remains a little background part of history from that point on. And do movies take over because now you can viscerally be scared? You know, in horror, H.G. Wells, you know, do these things start to move towards there's an easier way to do it? 
I can go to a theater and be scared. Well, the, the funny thing to me about movies and seances is that people now, as a result of horror movies, have a very different idea of what a seance must have been like than what they really were. They were actually kind of joyful. The traditional like 19th century form of a seance was one part party, one part magic show, one part revivalist meeting. They would sing at the start of the seance. People would talk about it being the most wondrous night of their lives. It wasn't until movies came along that we really got this association with horror and so forth, although the Catholic Church kind of started a little of that too, especially when the Ouija board became very popular during World War I. The Catholic Church started putting out like anti-Ouija board books and so forth. There's one from 1919 called The New Black Magic, which actually has, it's actually really hilarious now to read it. It says things like continuous use of the Ouija board will make a man an imbecile. <laughs> so, you know. but Lisa, why do you think it is, though, where most of the mediums um, and the spiritualists women? What do you, I mean, is there always looking for the political undertones or at least the feminist undertone of like what's going on here? Is there a connection between that? Uh, what do you think about that? There's a really odd connection I discovered. I happened to be writing both my seance history, calling the spiritual history of seances, at about the same time I was reading for weird women. And I started to realize I was reading the same thing over and over in regards to the women who were mediums. And yes, most of them were women and the women who were writing these ghost stories. And it was that quite often these were women who were poor and who saw either mediumship or writing as a valid way to make a living in the middle of the 19th century. And if you think about it, there weren't many options to women then. You were someone's daughter or someone's wife, or you were a domestic, or you went to work in a factory. That was kind of your options back then. So I can see why being a medium would have been very attractive to women who were perhaps a little bit more flamboyant or very attractive. A number of the mediums would very pretty. One of the most famous ones was a pretty young girl named Florence Cook, who was very, very successful for a while. The Fox sisters were very pretty as young girls. And with the writers who were coming along, many of them talk about how they had either lost a husband or lost a father. They had no other way to make a living. They were able to actually, back then, <laughs> unlike now, you could make a living writing short stories. And many of these women did. And um, so it was interesting to me that those seemed to be the most interesting alternatives to either working in one of those hor horrifying factories in the middle of the 19th century or being a maid in a big, rich household. How would you define horror? What constitutes the genre? What are the ingredients or five characters? Or is there something... What are what what constitutes horror as a as a genre? I I have a really simple definition which I actually gave away already, which is intent. And this is actually a subject of argument among a lot of horror writers. There there was a famous essay that came out about thirty years ago by a wonderful writer named Douglas Winter who argued that horror was not a genre and should not be marketed that way or whatever. But I disagree with that. It may not have its sort of tropes that have to be in a horror novel. Like I think science fiction maybe has more gadgets or elements or tropes or whatever than horror does. But to me, anything where your primary intent is to frighten or horrify or disturb the reader, I think that makes it horror. And the reason I always add disturb is that I don't think it has to be the kind of thing where, as we call them, spring-loaded cats are leaping out at you. The horror can be very low key. It can be the kind of thing where you might watch it and not even think it was really scary, but like two days later, you're still thinking about it. And you're kind of now it's kind of like, ooh, that was creepier than I thought. Is that what you were doing with lucid dreaming? Lucid dreaming is kind of a genre mashup for me. I kind of wanted to mash together science fiction, the road movie, and horror. And I also wanted to tell the story from the point of view of someone who is much more of an outsider character than you often get in horror, who is indeed a, a person who has had serious mental 
issues and is incarcerated because of those at the beginning of the story and who ends up becoming an unlikely hero in the midst of this new reality that she finds herself in. And yeah, I, I suppose the horrors in that are much more low key, although they're also almost a little bit gleeful in that. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in so many books you know, the covers, you know, how do, how do people select the covers? They're quite uh, horror covers. Is there a thing to that? Like each cover is so striking, you know? Oh, I'm, thank you. I'm glad to hear you say that. The truth is the authors rarely have much say over the covers. Mm. Oh, really? That's one of the most common misconceptions I get. One of the people who this book is dedicated to is my stepmother. And I, of course, sent her a copy of the book and she absolutely lo loved it and kept congratulating me on coming up with such a great cover. And <laughs> of course, I'm, tr I'm trying to say to her, I had nothing to do with it. I too, I got I just got really lucky with this fantastic cover. And I think self-publishing, the huge explosion of self-publishing and indie publishing over the last like 15 years has created this notion among many people that authors do indeed design their own covers. And unless you are an indie or self-publisher, you may have zero say over it. And I have had a few covers that I frankly did not care for. Do you, um, like when you're writing how long does it take to write it? Because you're so prolific. Like, how long does it take to write a story? I love writing short stories. That's my preferred form. I have kind of gotten that down to a real science and art both, I think. I'm not so good at no at novels. The sort of longer form thing is very hard for me. That, that'll that take me a year. And that's one of the reasons I don't do many novels. I've only done four because in the amount of time that it takes me to do one novel, I can probably do 10 short stories. And when you're doing a short story, do you just write it or do you outline it? You know, because it's, it strikes me as it has to be more concise than a long story. So how do you deal with that? I am definitely not what they call a pantser. <laughs> in, right. in writing circles, we have two, the plotter versus the pantser. And the plotter being someone who thinks their stuff through in detail and maybe outlines it. I don't outline short stories, but I rewrite them over and over and over in my head before I even set a single word to paper or pixel. So I work them through for weeks just in my head until I'm happy with them. And then I will sit down and actually type it out. Well, where do your ideas come from? Do you dream about them? Do you get, you know, during the course of your day, how, how are you, and are you keeping track because you are so incredibly prolific? You know, is there always another story right, right, right over there for you to write? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> to me, you can write stories about anything. A lot of the short stories that I write, I have to write to a theme. I, I will be brought into an anthology that already has a particular theme, or I will be brought into something like a shared world music novel, where I will not only have to write to a particular theme, I have to write to that theme within an, a larger arcing story, in which case I have to work with the editor in detail to get it right. But for example, example, I just uh, just today, in fact, I got news of a short story sale that I worked on that I'm really happy about because it's a science fiction story, which is not my usual thing. But it was for a book dealing with sort of odd takes on detectives. So I just thought about what would be the oddest take on a detective. And I, I ended up coming up with an idea of genetically engineered people in the future who are stuck into caste systems that define exactly what they're going to do for a living. And I kind of took off from there. And if it's a just a freelance story, I might, I love gardening. Nature is freaking weird. Um, <laughs> I can go out into my backyard right now and see like 10 strange things I could turn into horror stories. Now, do you love this bookstore, the Iliad bookstore? Yeah. Yeah, I actually am one of those weird writers. There aren't many of us who loves my day job. I tried being a writer with no other job for a while. It didn't work for me. I like being around people too much. Talk about sources for great horror stories. You know, any particular day I can get 10 great character ideas out of working at this bookstore. And since it is a used bookstore, the amount of research materials coming through there every day is incredible. It's just a constant churning resource for me and um i just love working there and i've been there for actually over 30 years oh wow, wow. you know that's a, there's a that's a story right there yeah. right you know um to be a great writer do you have to read a lot 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can you can tell when somebody just tries to be a writer and hasn't read enough. This is great, Lisa. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank for you. On. And everyone should go to I think it's lisamorton.com. We'll make sure people go there. Um, you have endless, incredible stories to be read and we can find out where to find them. So um, one last question. Is there a horror movie coming out that you're excited about? Looking forward to? Um, yeah, there are. There is a wonderful um, Cuban director named Alejandro Brujes, who I was just writing about actually earlier today in a nonfiction book I'm working on right now, who is going to be adapting a book by a wonderful writer named Gabino Iglesias called The Devil Takes You Home. And I cannot wait to see what that pair does with that book. All right. Wonderful. We'll, we'll, Thank we'll be you, watching Lisa. Out for it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. This was fun. 